hello everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the fourth webinar of being a manager leader in a VUCA world. A free short course presented by IT Masters and Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Cowd and I'm your course MC. Your mentor is CSU MBA course director, Kath Attry. As you likely know by now, we encourage questions and the use of chat in Zoom. So please feel free to tell us what you're thinking. I'm sure you're all sick of me asking you to send your chat to all panelists and attendees to keep everyone in the loop, but if you haven't already done so, please do. Your perspectives and insights or requests for clarification help make this the, the collaborative learning environment we hope to provide. So thank you. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible by text, uh, or uh, if they're particularly relevant to the presentation, I'll interrupt and we'll have a Q&A session uh, periodically as well. Hannah joins us from IT Masters as usual. She's responsible for the learn.itmasters.edu.au website, which is where, or the course page, which is where you'll find all of your other materials, readings, discussion forums, quizzes, um, and the exam. If you have any questions tonight or later on, please feel free to contact us and, and we'll try and help you out. Uh, the only other thing to mention is that we'll be talking about the course exam at the end of the session. So please hang around for that and hold any questions about uh, short course assessment until then. If you need to duck out before the end of the webinar, you can listen to the recording tomorrow or find the information on the course page because we make sure it's all there. Anyway, that's enough for me. What are you up to this time, Kath? Okay, hello everyone and thank you, Guy. Um, so this is our fourth, um, uh, our fourth short course, sorry, uh, just a minute, sorry, I just had some background noise there. Um, so our fourth week, we're looking at um, motivation and a little bit on uh, organisational culture. Um, so I might just start off with a um, Dilbert, as usual. Um, so this Dilbert, I think, uh, in this case, Dilbert's probably very close to me. And um, I'm the person who prefers a laptop. Um, students often come to me and they all talk to me and they'll I talk about sources or different um, resources they were they're using and they'll show me on their phones and I have no idea how they can read that amount of information on such a small device. So um, I thought it was partic particularly per pertinent uh, given that we're looking at managing people and we're looking at all the differences of the generations and different cultures and different backgrounds and different values um, today in our discussion. Oh, are we meant to be seeing the, the Dilbert already? Oh, it didn't move on. Sorry. Oh, okay. I, I thought you were Sorry. building suspense. <laughs> building suspense. Here we go. Thanks for that prompt, Guy. Oh, um, so, yeah, here we go. Are you getting a lot done on the grandpa box? The what? <laughs> oh, this is nice. <laughs> and then uh, the people in, our, in my generation do our work on our phones and tablets. <laughs> Sorry, I can't do that. Um, so yeah, very uh, cute and uh, particularly relevant for today. Um, but I thought I'd just take one final opportunity just to talk about uh, the MBA. Um, for those of you who may not have a bachelor, I thought I'd just uh, highlight that if you do have some post-secondary qualification, so that may be some certificate or diploma or something, uh, or a number of industry certifications, plus some uh, industry experience with some at a team leader discretionary uh, decision-making uh, level, um, then we would usually accept you into a graduate certificate in commerce and you would do four subjects. And once you've completed those four subjects, you'd be then able to transfer across to the MBA and you would get credit for those four subjects and only have eight remaining. Um, so that's a possibility. Obviously, if you do have a bachelor degree, um, then uh, we would uh, like you to also have some industry experience because an MB the value of an MBA is best uh, realised when you do have some industry experience um, and then you can come into our directly into our masters. Okay so I'll move on um, and then just quickly quickly this is not the MBA computing this is the general masters that I look after 
Um, and so within that general masters, we offer um, four core subjects for uh, restricted electives, and then you can specialise. And you can specialise from a range of, in a range of areas. Um, accounting and finance, business analysis, operations and strategy. We also have a lot of school principals doing our course, so we do offer educational leadership specialisation, um, entrepreneurship and leadership, human resource management, IT is an option, leadership, marketing, project management, public sector management and social impact. And the project management specialisation, um, a lot of those subjects are actually taught um, by our, through our partnership with uh, IT Masters. Okay, so that's enough about the course. What I'll move on in is um, uh, continue on with this week's topic. So I just thought I'd start up by putting up um, these general uh, classifications around um, the generations. Uh, and this is obviously very Western centric, very English speaking centric, um, but I did some research and there are some similar differences in other cultures. So if uh, when we're looking at China, there's, you know, differences in the people who were born prior to the um, revolution. Um, and then there's a, a group of people that were um, born just before the 1960s and the great proletariat proletariat revolution and then there's the people born in the 70s and 80s around the post Mao era a period of reform and then you've got the people born in the booms of the 80s and 90s and similarly India will have those generational differences the pre-independence early independence and then as the country changed and reformed and grew so it is, this is particularly Western centric, but I think you'll find within your own cultures, um, if you are from overseas, there may be similar things. Um, I would like to say at the outlet, outset though, that it is stereotyping. Um, so not everybody who's born in the, this particular uh, year, years will have the same characteristics, they don't. But within that, uh, there are some broad generalizations. So researchers have studied people and found things that resonate with people um, and behavior patterns that are more likely um, amongst groups that are born in a certain era. Um, when I looked at this, I thought it was really interesting. Um, but particularly the one on the left, which is about what happened in that time. So what happens in society is often a huge influence on people's values and behaviour. Um, so in with the traditionists who were my parents, um, the Great Depression and World War II were enormous um, uh, events that had a, a significant effect on them and their psyche and my parents were British so you know the whole sort of dig for victory everything for the country you know that whole community coming together save reuse all of that was a big influence on them um, then we have the boomers the people that were born after the war and their big er issues were things like Vietnam uh, the Vietnam War had an enormous impact on them but then the moon landing so that was such a significant an event in a lot of those people's lives um, and so then in my generation which is Gen X um, the fall of the Berlin Wall was such a big thing um, so that was kind of the beginning of the end of um, you know the whole sort of Cold War era um, the Gulf War was another huge uh, uh, Advent, MTV was so huge, but then of course AIDS was a big issue. And I've seen mobile phones are in sort of like our, uh, they didn't, well, as far as I'm, I'm aware, they didn't come in until the 90s for me anyway. Um, then we've got the millennials, and that was really interesting to me to look at what was uh, significant for them. So it was the 9-11 uh, attacks, but then obviously the rise of initially MySpace and then Facebook and uh, those sort of things. And then now we've got the younger generations and so they're people and if they were born after 1997, some of them are actually 23 now. So this graphics uh, kind of a little bit interesting, but, um, but yeah, so they're quite different again. So they're quite driven by apps and social games and devices. Um, and what we see is that generally, and again, these are sweeping generalizations, so they're not true of every single people, but that it impacts on their aspirations and their attitudes towards employment and behavior in the workplace. So the traditionists were that job for life um, generation. 
And in, to some extent, the boomers thought they were, had a job to, for life and so they had that loyalty to employers. Um, whereas Gen Xers, we uh, were part of the 80s, greedy is good, and then the 90s, you know, the recession we had to have. So um, we saw a lot of upheaval, change, um, restructuring, downsizing, acquisitions, all sorts of things happening. So our, our view of jobs wasn't around um, jobs for life, but uh, we maybe uh, looked at sort of career paths and things like work-life balance uh, increasingly becoming important in this generation. With the millennials, what we see is more with, um, and, and particularly for uh, Gen Z or Gen 2020, we see that the, um, the less firm workplace, um, the, what is it called? Um, uh, the gig economy is having such a bigger impact on them. So they're actually, if they're a millennial, they tend to embrace it with freedom and flexibility. I'm not sure that Gen Z is so much because they're in their very early stages of their career, but they definitely are going to have a lot of uh, change and variability in their work, uh, working environment. Okay, so, so what's fun to kind of like say, oh, they're a boomer and that's why they're behaving like that. Um, I don't think we should demonize and judge people and put people in boxes. We should be open to people having differences um, and respecting those differences. But as a manager leader, it's probably important to recognize that those different values that people bring to the work and, the, and their work practices um, mean that they will behave differently in the workplace and they may be motivated by really different things. Um, so, for example, if you're, if you're supervising a boomer, um, at this stage in their career, they're probably quite loyal to the organisation, but they may be looking to sort of like have more, um, uh, a shorter working week, or um, they may be focused on uh, maximising the income for retirement. So there's a lot of variability there, but you've got to think about what they're, you know, the stage of life that they're at and how that sits with their particular situation, their values, and that will impact on their motivations. Um, um, so I think overall, talent, uh, managing the talent base is, is one of the most challenging um, parts of a manager's job um, in any organisation. And so, human, you know, across the world, that human capital management is, is the biggest challenge. And when we add to not just multiple generations at work, but um, we also look at um, multi-ethnic teams, dispersed teams, so people are dispersed across the globe, um, we see that, you know, it is a huge challenge for our VUCA managers, um, managing all those people at different stages of life with different values, ideas and different motivators. And so we're gonna talk about how you might address that as we go along today. All right. Um, Okay, I'm just making, oh, and I got a poll question now, haven't I, Guy? Um, do you want to put that we one sure up? sure do. Uh, which generational group do you align with? I'm, I'm thinking there's probably not going to be too many traditionalists. Because... Mm, I'd be very interested in hearing whether people actually align with a group age-wise, but feel... A couple mentality of is, is different. Chuck that in the chat if, if that's you. Right, so very few Gen Zs. In fact, none. Mm -hmm. So nobody under 23. And it's interesting too, when we look at this, there is actually a bit of difference in the dates on this. So in mm. one, they've got 76 for Gen X and the other, they've got 77. Um, so, you know, it's just a broad grouping. It doesn't mm. mean if you were born on 31st of December 1964, you're a boomer, and 1st of January 1965, mm -hmm. you're a Gen X. You know, obviously there's some gray area. Mm. Okay, so a lot of people like me, Gen X. Um, so we're mid, mid to, well, probably senior end of the career. Um, yeah, so probably got mm, 15, 20 years working life yet. So still a sizable amount of our working life. Um, and then quite a few millennials as well, and quite a few boomers. So, um, so a number of boomers that probably got about 10, maybe more years working life, unless you want to go on and be like Rupert Mur Murdoch and work until you're 
Well, into your 80s. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> oh, you know, it's all well, don't, to... don't be like Rupert Murdoch. Is <laughs> no, don't be like Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for um, any fan. Yeah. So, all right. So, that's great. Thank you very much, um, Guy. All right. So, um, just um, I thought that, um, I mean, obviously, some of these images we, we used before. So, the dispersed teams um, is represented by the image on the left. But the um, what we see in Australia, particularly, is this whole focus on an inclusive workforce. And the idea is, with Australia being such a multi-ethnic uh, country, um, that we really need to have um, a very inclusive workforce that um, brings in people regardless of their family status, their gender, their educational background, military service, that's a bit of a US thing, I think, um, their personality style, their language background, their race, their ethnicity. And increasingly, we see with dispersed teams, uh, even their location is not so much, uh, they don't have to be in the same location, they can be located out, uh, externally to the uh, physical presence of the organisation. Also uh, inclusive of people regardless of their uh, sexual orientation or their disability. And when we say disability, I mean obviously there's disability like um, for example, intellectual disability, but increasingly we see um, mental health disability is a major impact in the workplace. And at Charles Sturt University, we've had a few um, uh, what do you call it, military people, ex-military, ex-forces people who have had PTSD. And it's been really great to work with them and help them manage their PTSD because obviously at assignment time, that's a time when high anxiety goes up. And if you suffer from something like PTSD, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, then that's going to be a really debilitating time. So we've been able to work with people and get a couple of people uh, well, a couple that I'm aware of um, through. And it's it's been fantastic because they are incredibly smart people. They've got a lot to bring and they've got, you know, a lot to sort of show for their, um, and they are quite committed. Um, so it's really rewarding when you do see somebody get through. Um, and then obviously uh, various backgrounds and ages and generations and life stages. So um, whether people have a family, don't have a family, are empty nesters, are grandparents, all of those sort of things. So they all matter in the workplace and they all impact on how people behave. Um, so, um, so dive, but the thing that's really, um, shown through research is that diversity in the workplace can bring strong business benefits, including access to more diverse and innovative thinking, enhanced capacity to serve existing and future customers, and even higher profitability. And in Australia in the 90s, um, National Australia Bank made a big effort to um, staff a number of its branches that were in areas where there was a strong ethnic community with people speaking those languages. And at that particular time, it wasn't a very profitable time for banks. And they were one of the few, in Australia we have the big four banks, um, they were the only big four bank that turned a profit during that period. I think it was the 90s. Um, so you, having a diverse workforce was extremely profitable for them during that period because they could um, really target those small businesses that uh, were often migrant, uh, you know, part of migrant communities. Okay. And baby Yoda has decided she needs to make an appearance just in case anyone was missing her. Um, I, um, the other thing that happens in the workplace, obviously, and challenges uh, managers and leaders, I might just stop my video for a moment. So, <laughs> <laughs> because well, it's diversity distracting will me. Yes. <laughs> yes, the, yes, this is the, uh, you know, working uh, different hours and with uh, family members present. Um, it really is a VUCA world. Isn't it? <laughs> it is a very VUCA world. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's start off with this slide um, with a question because um, I'm quite interested um, before I talk about what this means, um, how many different cultures are represented in your work team? So not in your whole organisation, but in your work team. So there might be five, six, eight people. Uh, okay, we've well, got, yeah, depending on the size of the team, some teams could be big, 
um, at the university here, if I take the School of Management and Marketing, that would be probably about 30 people. Um, Yeah, right. Overwhelmingly, a, a fair, fairly limited number. Uh, well, oh, um, 60 percent. There could yeah. be small teams too. Yeah. That buy, you know, like yeah. if if the team size is only eight and you've got five mm. different cultures, then that yeah. actually is quite a big proportion. Yeah, so, for example, no. Palmer in the chat, uh, team of four, uh, team of four, and four different backgrounds. Aaron, team of four, three different backgrounds. So, yeah, um, and, and interesting. And it, it does really matter on, you know, team harmoniousness and, and, you know, like your ability to work together and things like that. And so it's about navigating that space that sometimes becomes really important. Um, mm. So I'm just wondering how many people actually have heard of Hofstede. Um, and that's obviously, can it, can, I'm just going to stop for a moment and just um, address the issue in the room here. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, I'll, I'll share the poll. Uh, we've got yep. uh, 41, or, uh, we've got 55% two to five, but yeah, as we said, maybe some small teams and only one person has said 20 different cultures. So I'd love to hear who that was in the chat if, if possible and sort of see what sort of size team that is and, and what context that is. Uh, otherwise a fairly you know, standard. Okay. All right. Uh, is Kath raising her hand? I don't know. Um, I might have accidentally. Um, okay. <laughs> it's raising, uh, raising hand to, uh, um, to So else. now where's your poll? Sorry, I missed that one. Oh, okay. Uh, so the poll, I? I'll reshare it. We've got 55% yep, two to five. Ah, yes, that's um, right. 30% six to 10, 12% 11 to 20. And only one person claiming, um, you know, 20 plus. Yeah. Um, and, and we can't answer the poll, so it's not Kath. Yeah. Okay. So sorry. Sorry about that, people. <laughs> no, no worries at all. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, Hofstede, that's what I was asking um, people um, if anybody's heard of Hofstede. Um, Favours individuals with Aboriginal community experience, hence not many cultures. Yeah, okay. But obviously you've got that. Uh, and there are so many Aboriginal cultures, obviously, within Australia as well. So um, there's that diversity there, Geoffrey. Um, and today, on week four, is when I've managed to, uh, to be able to read the chat as well as deliver the lectures. Um, so Hofstede, um, he worked for IBM, and I think he was uh, in the 60s. And at the time, IBM was a large multinational um, company. And so he, he launched a big survey of all of the IBM uh, employees and, and looked at their differences in the way they um, view the world and their values and how they behave. And he mapped these differences on, initially it was four dimensions, which was power distance, individualism, masculinity and uncertainty avoidance. But there's been a lot done with Hofstede's work and he's done a lot himself over the past 40 years or more. And that, so there's been a couple of additional um, dimensions added, which is long-term orientation and indulgence. And so I just pulled off, um, and so you can go to this website, hofsteadinsights.com, and you can actually just use their, um, uh, their online tool and you can put in the cultures that you're dealing with. So um, the person that had four cultures, they could go and put all in the, the four cultures that they work in. And it'd be a lovely collective exercise for you to do because it'd show you all how you all sort of view things quite differently. And it it then, you know, opens up that understanding of people and their, the way they behave and the way they um, uh, operate and how they see things differently. Um, but if we look at this particular one, we start with power distance. Australia is quite an egalitarian country. Um, and so we actually um, score quite low on power distance. I was quite surprised how low Ireland scores as well on power power distance. Um, but when you look at uh, China, that's quite high on power distance and then Italy's around the mid range. And so that's pretty much the extent to which people accept differences and, and sort of like power differences between um, team members. So it's about whether the boss is, you know, viewed more highly or whether they're seen to be on your level. Um, and, and also it's around uh, acceptance of inequality. So somewhere like uh, China is much more accepting of people um, having more power and more wealth and, and um, having more people, a lot of people that aren't as powerful or wealthy, whereas Australia tries to even out 
uh, those um, things through its social welfare report. Uh, system. But anyway, so um, so it's also about the influence of formal authority and sanctions and how sort of uh, respectful, I suppose, for want of a better word, you are towards um, authority. Um, and so basically, because Australia is quite egalitarian, hierarchy in an organisation is more established for convenience, convenience and supervisors are always accessible and managers rely on individual employees and teams for their expertise. So the boss isn't the holder of all the knowledge, the, the manager will expect that team members will contribute and that they will actually participate. So, and that often can be quite differences between the way people behave. Um, so if you come from a high power distance uh, culture, you might not be so willing to pipe up and say what you think should be done because it's not respectful and it's not the norm. Um, and so, you know, in Australia, our communications direct, participative and more informal, whereas in um, some high power distance countries, it might be more uh, indirect and through structure uh, and, you know, the chain of command. Um, and so then we look at individualism, and this is really around um, whether the primacy is on the individual or the collective. Um, and so China is a highly collectivist culture uh, where the interest of the groups group is uh, given greater weight. Um, and that group considerations can affect things like hiring and promotion um, within groups getting preferential treatment. Um, employer commitment to the organisation is lower than commitment to the group. So um, that's uh, where, you know, we might sort of try and align people in Australia around the organisation, the organisation's values. There it will be more around the people and the, the, the group that's important. Um, but Australia is highly individualistic. Um, people expected to be self-reliant to display initiative. Um, but we also expect that um, people are rewarded and promoted on merit. Um, so you know, that can be quite a difference. And uh, yeah, so I see that Ireland and, and um, Italy are quite high as well. So the big, big difference there is um, China. Interesting for you for masculinity, they're all pretty similar. Um, this is really more about competition, achievement and success. Um, so you see cultures like the Nordic countries um, scoring higher on the femininity scale, um, but Italy, China, Ireland and Australia have all sco scored fairly highly on the masculinity scale. So it's about being success uh, oriented and driven. Um, I guess the differences between China and Australia is that uh, in China you see that um, leisure time is not as highly valued, um, whereas Australia um, it's highly valued. But we still have this high kind of like strive to be the best, focus on success, winner take all, all um, being proud of your successes and achievements in life. Um, that sort of thing. But I think for the VUCA world, the really interesting one is the uncertainty avoidance dimension. And this is around how you deal with ambiguity and uncertainty. <sighs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't read the chat because it distracts me. <laughs> um, so I just saw some interesting points up there, but I'll just keep going. Um, so with the uncertainty avoidance, um, Interesting that China had a very low score on uncertainty avoidance. Um, and when I looked at the analysis on the website, it says, um, uh, truth may be relative, though in immediate social circles, there is concern for truth with a capital T and rules. Um, nonetheless, adherence to laws and rules may be flexible to suit the actual situation and pragmatism is a fact of life. The Chinese are comfortable with ambiguity. The Chinese language, language is full of ambiguous meanings that can be difficult for Western people to follow. Chinese are adaptable and entrepreneurial. At the time of writing, the majority, 70 to 80% of Chinese businesses tend to be small to medium sized and family owned. So, the good thing is China seems quite well set for a VUCA world and uh, Italy 
less so because they're not as uh, acceptable, uh, accepting of change and ambiguity and look for more structure and, and certainty and uh, regulation and, and, and um, safety. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting. So we need people obviously with that tolerance for ambiguity in the VUCA world. So, um, you know, it's helpful if we do have a more diverse culture because uh, people can be more comfortable with that flexibility and that change and, that, and, and be more adaptable. Um, and then long-term orientation is about, um, I think the best example of this is, you know, if, you, if an Australian goes to Asia, they want to close the deal before they return home. Whereas Asians often want to get to know you to sort of like understand who you are, spend some time in cultivating the relationship because they're thinking about the business impacts for the long term, not the sort of like uh, the quick results. So they're sort of more about the, you know, the um, making a sort of sound and um, worthwhile and fruitful and ongoing relationship rather than just getting a quick result. Um, and the last one is about indulgence and really the focus on um, perhaps um, leisure and work-life balance and um, you know holidays and and also you know luxury and things like that in Australia. Uh, scores quite high on that. I was surprised how low Italy scores on that. But great tool if you want to go in and have a look at the way different people value things and different um, uh, behaviours. It can really give you some insights in some of the challenges and differences and maybe some of the conflicts that are occurring in your organisation in terms of the different way people view things. Okay. Um, um, yeah, but also, again, um, I'm seeing that John says, see, there's a bit of Aussie in you, and I'm not sure who's saying that to you, probably Kim <laughs> Yang. But what I was <laughs> going to say is that, you know, Australian of Chinese heritage will obviously be somewhere between the blue and the purple. Mm. Um, yeah, so go on, Guy, I'll cut you off. No, that's okay. That, that, um I just wonder, you know, we were talking last week about sustainability and, and you know, whether long-term orientation would actually, you know, reflect an interest in that as well. Um, you, you look at, I guess, you know, you could say sort of subjectively and perhaps, you know, putting all of my political positions out there, you know, in terms of the environmental thing, you can see China's doing amazing things in terms of, you know, green energy and perhaps we could do some more. Um, you can sort of see the, the huge disparity there between the two. Yeah. Yeah. And it, they, they, it is interesting because they are really um, looking for re ways to build their renewables and, and, you know, alternatives and things like that. And obviously investing quite heavily in science and technology. Um, so long-term orientation. Yeah. I suspect. Hmm. Yeah, I'd have to delve in more about that because I kind of started the whole Hofstede journey with the four dimensions. And so these two long-term orientation and indulgence mm. are not ones I'm so familiar with. Yeah. Um, and Kim's made a really amazing, like really good point in the uh, chat. It would be interesting to know what part of China was studied, you know, include attitudes would change from East to West. And you could say the same in Australia. Um, yeah. And obviously, China in the 60s is quite different to China in the 2020s. Um, so has it been adapted for the change in society? Um, yeah, yeah, of course. But great critical thinking people, you're all very good candidates for an MBA um, because those are the questions you should be asking about the data. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, excellent. John saying big difference in, you know, Shanghai and Guangzhou. And again, you know, um, I know Indians always say that, you know, in, in India, you're actually one of the, you know, somebody from a, a, a culture that, and India is so full of such a vast and rich um, variety of cultures. And when they come to Australia, they're just Indians and, you know, they almost lose part of their identity. So yes, so many nuances. Um, Okay, 
So, but I think the, the main thing is you're never going to know everything about everybody and their background and their cultural values and, and you know, what sort of made them tick. It's about understanding that people do have um, different values and that they all bring different perceptions and, and they have different motivators. And so, you know, trying to work out how you're going to harness that um, within the organisation is the key. All right, so I might move on. All right, um, so we saw in topic one that the VUCA world has seen a rise in social entrepreneurship. Um, and there has been a number of papers or um, theorists that have put forward the argument that millennials in particular are, just, are per, more purpose and values driven, preferring to work for companies whose missions align with their personal values. Now, again, I'm taking a Western centric view, um, but we do see that very much in, uh, in Australia, that it's often the younger people that are driving a lot of those um, social uh, entrepreneurships. Um, so there is a general consensus that younger people do care more about it. Um, so uh, obviously, um, I think what is a powerful message to everybody is within organisations, a big motivator can be purpose. Um, and uh, purpose can carry many benefits such as energised employees, stronger organisational alignment, greater customer loyalty and greater value that comes from making longer term investments in people or products or services or markets. Um, and it helps employees align around a clear vision or value system and it provides guidance and clarity as well as commitment. And I think there was no better example of this in the Australian um, uh, environment than the well, not just the New South Wales Rural Fire Services, but any of the volunteer fire services that are in, uh, in existence in Australia in the period December, January. These people were getting up and going out and working for 12, 14, 16 hour shifts day after day for absolutely no money nothing at all and that is a purpose-driven culture you know the commitment around that the alignment around that um, is amazing and it, then it wasn't just the rural fire services you had the country women's association you had you know red cross you had st vincent's de paul you had um you know any number of small community organizations all coming together and trying to sort of work together to um battle these events and i think that if there's any like telling example of how um, purpose can really uh, motivate and energise and direct people's energies to achieve amazing outcomes, then that is it. Um, and so that's really something to think about is, you know, what is the good that you're doing with what, you know, in your team? Um, and really thinking about the purpose and what are the values and what are, I mean, it doesn't have to be if you, you don't think your organisation has a purpose driven um, approach. Um, just think about what it is that you're doing and think about the good things that you're doing and what are the benefits and advantages of your team and what do they bring to other people. And if you can all align around that, that actually is something that's very motivating and very empowering for people. Okay, yes, and Simon Sinek, Sinek is, a, is a, a good one. Uh, what is your why? And just for our international participants, I just thought I'd show this. This was an app that we were all watching on like, you know, several times a day um, during December, November. And um, basically all of those uh, little uh, icons there are fires. And there was something like more than 300 uh, fires burning across the east coast of Australia and um, what we were all you know you can actually scroll in into your area so you can make that map um, you know uh, what is it you know like zoom in basically to your area to see where the fire is and how far it is from where you are and what you're looking for is anything that was yellow or red because that was where they were highly dangerous um, so it was quite a significant event for us but um, now with all this rain and flood we've been having um, most of them are almost out but I do want to say that um, it's not just millennials that um, care about values. Um, so uh, even amongst, you know, a number of you were, were Gen Xers and were boomers and, and, and you probably care about values too. So, and it's not just millennials who are actually starting up 
um, uh, uh, social impact organisations. And here's two examples from my personal um, experience. A friend of mine, Sue, she worked as a, oh, I don't know, managing director in Corn Ferry. She um, was a regional director in Asia. She's given up that job and she's launched, launched her own um, startup, which is um, uh, solid shampoos and soaps, um, solid shampoos and conditioners, sorry. Um, and so it's called Kind Two, and it's obviously got recyclable packaging because she cares. I mean, I suppose the other thing is that she's able to afford to do this too, so that helps. Um, but then there's this other one called Sprout Ed, and that was launched by a Central West woman, um, and it is focused on trying to improve women's financial literacy because um, in Australia, women have uh, poorer financial uh, financial outcomes and poorer financial literacy than um, uh, many men. And the biggest number of uh, the gro big, the largest growing area num I suppose what is it? The biggest group growing in terms of homelessness is um, women. In older over the, over 50 and that generally happens as a result of a relationship background and they haven't really um, had good financial skills so there are two examples of purpose-driven organizations that have been started up by Gen X's and I'm sure there's plenty of boomers out there and, and um, other people doing it as well all right um, so I just want to say um, you know, in terms of uh, purpose-driven organisation, another really uh, well-known one is Dove. Um, and so I don't know how many of you are aware of the Dove soap and they had a campaign around that for real beauty. Now, the cynic in me says it was a bit of a, um, possibly a little bit of a marketing campaign, but nevertheless, it was lauded as being an incredibly powerful campaign. It was about focusing on women who were real, not models, not skinny models. The people in their adverts were really like real. And um, the outcome of that campaign was that people who worked for Dove themselves actually um, felt better about the organisation and more committed to it and, you know, like um, uh, engaged and striving and proud of who they uh, work for. And um, I think that's a really powerful example. And then I also uh, found a Forbes uh, uh, article um, today that said that um, quoted a survey of MBA graduates from top business schools, I would say in America, um, found that over 97% of respondents were willing to sacrifice up to 14% of their financial compensation to work for a company that is socially responsible and ethical. Um, and then 87% of employees at companies with cause marketing campaigns are loyal to their employers compared to only 66% of those without such programs. So if you had a cause related marketing campaign like the Dove one, um, then your engagement went up to sort of something like four fifths of your employees compared to two thirds. Um, so quite powerful. Tall poppy syndrome, oh, I'll let people explain that to Kim. <laughs> Okay, um, so culture obviously has a big impact and having a purpose driven culture is talked about. So what is culture? Um, so organize it, and I love this quote, it's um, Peter Singer, I'm not sure, I can't remember who it was. I should have written it down. Um, it's a very famous quote anyway, that culture is strategy for breakfast. So your strategy can be really good, but if you don't have the right organizational culture, then whatever you've like um, planned for your strategy is probably not going to work because the culture is going to impinge on um, you actually achieving that. So culture is something we really need to um, concentrate on. And it is something that can be changed, but it does take time. Um, and it does need that from the top. So as a um, manager leader of a team, you can actually influence the culture of the people working for, for you very strongly. Um, can you influence the culture from the whole organisation? Maybe not, um, but you can start with your own area and make that a happy place. Um, and then, you know, from that you can move uh, beyond there. So, 
what it consists of things like culture norms, ceremonies, events, rules and policies, goals and measurement, management behaviours. The example you set is the example that sets the rule. So what you are willing to walk past um, is what sets the tone. Um, rewards and recognition. So who's rewarded? Is it merit based, you know, or is it around friends or is it around likes, dislikes, you know, all of that sort of thing. Whether you invest in your people and train them and, and that doesn't have to be expensive either. Is it give them an hour off to go and attend a MOOC um, or let them attend a MOOC while they're in um, or MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course, just in case anyone didn't know. But let them do it, you know, in their lunch hour or not in their lunch hour, in their working hour once a week or something like that. So it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, and there's so many free short courses now. Mm -hmm. um, or you could study a master's. You could study a master's and give your staff time off and financial support for that. Um, and that is certainly beneficial in the long term. Um, how you communicate, what's your organisational structure, even the physical environment. Um, they all have an impact on culture. So culture is the way things are done around here. Um, it does also encompass shares, values, beliefs, understanding norms and behaviours. So what do people need to do to get promoted? What is acceptable behaviour in the workplace? What is the normal things that people do? What what gets noticed, what doesn't, um, you know, who gets rewarded, how people are rewarded, uh, all of those sort of things um, matter. Um, so, but it also impacts on how decisions are made, who makes them, how quickly, whether the organisation has an appetite for risk, whether failure is accepted or frowned upon, how customers are viewed. Now, I've worked for organisations where it's like, oh, make them wait, let them wait, those customers, let them wait. And that's a terrible thing um, to c come into uh, an organisation like that. And to change that view is really, you know, quite important. Um, which stakeholders are prioritised um, by an organisation and why? Another organisation I worked for in um, Papua New Guinea, I worked for Transparency International, and they used to try and get people to join Transparency International, but the price to join was too keen, so that was one dollar. And so when, <laughs> the, when you joined, you got four newsletters a year, you got, oh, like a whole load of things. And I was saying, well, it costs you more to service these two dollar too keen of customers than it actually that you actually get in revenue. So it was a bit, you know, we had to rethink the what they were doing and we had to try and get them to rather than go for lots of people at low value, still keep those lots of people at light, low value, but really target some high value um, members who would be willing to, you know, donate more. So, you know, all of those things um, can change the culture um, of an organisation. Um, okay. How, how right. long did you work there? What, what? Oh, it was an it was a volunteer thing, um, guy. So I, it was um, a, a couple of months at a volunteer placement. So I went in, and um, it was amazing, though. I mean, what an extraordinary organisation Transparency International is, and you saw the very best of humanity, and you saw the wor mm. what the worst. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, I'm trying to get my curse. I've got it on to the next. Okay. So in the VUCA world, um, there, there is some recommendations about the best type of strategies that, uh, and cultures, sorry, the best type of culture you need to match with the best type of strategy. Um, but I think I will stop and just say something quite important. Um, the reason that we focus on, um, culture, purpose driven culture, uh, you know, engagement, happy employees, all of that sort of thing is that two of the biggest organisational costs are absenteeism and turnover. So a really good measure of whether you've got a good culture or whether your cult, the culture of your organisation is not optimal is to look at your absenteeism and turnover and benchmark that against the industry. Um, and, and, you know, there should be data out there um, on that sort of benchmarking. And also whether your, uh, what are the trends? So in the last 12 months, has your absenteeism increased um, or has it dropped? Has your turnover increased or has it dropped? Um, and 
are you seeing turnover in particular pockets? Because that could be a flag for something that's happening, you know, that you need to sort of like address in the organisation. That is a huge cost because rec recruiting a replacement is actually quite, it can be up to 120% of the cost, the annual cost of somebody, depending on the level of the person. But absenteeism is also a, a big organisational cost as well. So, so those two, uh, when um, organisations look at whether they've got a good culture or not, one of the really easy, quick ways to, you know, try and identify if you've got a problem is absenteeism and turnover. All right, um, so in terms of the VUCA environment, a firm's culture can be a competitive advantage or a liability. Um, so, and some recent theoretical evidence indicates that companies most likely to succeed in a turbulent world are those that can energize and motivate employees around higher idea deals and shared goals. So we're back to that whole purpose again. Um, so, the manager need, leader needs to align the values and the rewards around the organisational strategy. So if your organisational strategy is around growth in a sector, so you say, right, what are we trying to do? We're trying to achieve growth, but, but growth in what way? So what, what values and purpose can you about it? It's about respecting customers, respecting each other, about managing it, about doing it in a sustainable way. Whatever you can do to put values around it and then the rewards, okay. Now you may not have the discretionary power to say like, I'll give you a pay rise. Um, so the reward can be things like praise, recognition, employee uh, certificates, employee of the month, um, saying thank you is so undervalued that the, the uh, or, or saying what a great job um, is really underestimated the value of that. So if you don't have a lot of money, there are so many things you can do that don't cost anything to recognise employees. Um, they just take a little bit of time. Morning teas, um, anything like that. Okay, so uh, a manager leader, uh, we've already done that. Um, so if you, for, and this is how the culture might sort of match with the um, type of strategy. If a firm's pursuing a differentiation strategy, and a lot of you, you, you mentioned your firms were pursuing a differentiation strategy, um, then you've got to think about that. That probably requires you to be different. Maybe that it means that you need to have a bit of a product leadership value discipline because what you're doing that's different and how you can continually uh, keep that being different matters to um, your customers. Um, so you probably need an adaptability culture where innovation and creativity are awarded and people aren't afraid to fail. Um, if you've got a focus strategy and you really have a strong customer connection, so you really uh, well, so when we used the example of focus, it was um, things like artisans might or bespoke, um, bespoke bicycles, something like that, bespoke cars, crafted things, tailor-made, then you, that customer intimacy is, in, intimacy is really important. And so you need more of an involvement culture. So let's just talk about what's the characteristics of those four kind of recommended cultures. So an adaptive culture, it's more useful for high risk environments where you need fast response. Um, and in that culture, you need people to have the autonomy to make decisions um, in order to serve those highly valued customers. And so creativity, innovation and risk taking are things that need to be rewarded. Obviously risk taking within boundaries so people know the extent of the risk that they can risk um, so that you don't have spectacular failures, but allowing people to be, it to be okay if you fail. Um, the achievement culture is more stay, suitable to stable environments. So that's the more you know, past environment or a stable environment where you know what your funding is, nothing's going to change. Um, and then it's more about um, uh, initiative and drive to work hard. Um, high performance might be rewarded there. An involvement culture puts a high value on employee participation, cooperation and support. And that's where I think if you think about the eco leadership approach that um, Simon Weston advocates, that's when customers and community are all embedded in the whole leadership 
approach and you really um, sort of take a leadership and a culture that is very inclusive. You work together collaboratively with everybody in your system or your environment to get the best outcome for everyone. Um, and the last one, the consistency culture, that's uh, where there's a focus on uh, rationality, rules, procedures and order. And I think in that uh, particular uh, example, maybe if you're a governance organisation or something like that, uh, an auditor or something uh, where you're the body that sort of has to enforce the rules, then consistency is really critical for you. And you can't be um, at anything but that because it's that's the importance of uh, your organisation. Um, so that, how do you get to that? Well, I think you just have to focus on, all right, within your team itself, what are the things that are really important? What are the things we want to focus on? If you want to uh, focus on improvement, new flexibility, changing the product line, changing the service models, that sort of thing, then start doing it small. Okay, th get your team together and say, how can we innovate? What little things can we do better to service our customers? Um, and then when people come up with those ideas, really recognise them and reward them. Okay. So, oh, I was going to, I actually missed a um, poll there. So we'll just move back and I'm, we've got another poll, haven't we? Um, guys, uh, how would you describe the culture in your organisation? Can you see it being any one of them? Or is it, okay, none of the above all? That's disappointing, isn't it? <laughs> it's so sad. <laughs> what the hell? It might be worth <laughs> you thinking about it, like writing it down. What is it that's, you know, valued? Um, just start sort of, because if mm. you can diagnose what it is and how it operates, then you can start trying to influence change yeah. i'd be really interested in hearing in the chat what extent to what extent those listening actually think they can drive the culture of their organization um. you can always do something don't think you're powerless <laughs> you can always do something thanks kath <laughs> <laughs> you can <laughs> and just be you know have your values and your you know your purpose and you stick to it i know sometimes you feel like you're defeated but people will notice and people will appreciate mm. it and maybe people will become like you like um if for example Perish the thought if you're always nice to customers and somebody's not nice, just say, oh, you know, like, I would really hate to be in that person's shoes. And, you, you know, like, I think, um, let's think about how we can, you know, provide a bit of, you know, something nice for them. Um, they may say that, oh, I don't care about them. They were being rude. It's like, well, if you can try and just influence a little bit, um, change people's views and perceptions in a nice way, I think, over time. Well, it's a lot of achievement oriented. Okay, we're all, all about mm. getting results. Can be good, but it can be <laughs> disappointing too. Um, uh, because sometimes, well, is it important? What is being, yeah, I mean, what is valued? Um, yeah. I, I, you'd obviously have to know the organisation to be able to comment about whether that's appropriate, whether that's beneficial in the long term, whether that's the best type of culture for that. But I can see that happens a lot. Yeah, and just for those listening at home uh, later to the recording, where I'm not certain of the uh, it doesn't the show group, up. Uh, adaptive, sixteen percent; achievement oriented, thirty-one percent; involvement driven, ten percent; consistent, nineteen percent; and none of the above, twenty-four percent. So, mm -hmm. mm, quite interesting. Very interesting. Oh, we're at eight thirty. Oh my goodness. I really oh, um, it's the last one. Let's keep going. <laughs> it's a free course. So the more free content, the better, I think. <laughs> if people need to drop off, then um, I, I won't be uh, uh, upset. I've talked way too I, much. I will be personally offended. <laughs> um, I might skip over this one um, and we'll move on to the... Oh, my God, there's so much to go through. Um, okay, I'll be totally... Um, well, that's the point we... of the recording, Kat. <laughs> it's, it's totally fine. <laughs> okay. Can, everyone can listen later. 
All right, so I thought about how do you motivate employees, how do you, to get the outcomes you want. So there's lots of different motivation theories and I think we, it's good to get something from all of them. Um, the most classic one, but actually empirically, so in, in terms of testing, it's probably not the most um, uh, reliable, uh, valid one is this Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think it kind of gives you a bit of a kind of, yeah, sounds good, but it, it, you know, how well it works, I don't know. But anyway, it's the idea that uh, people need to satisfy needs. So they need to satisfy physiological needs, which is um, food, water, uh, food, water, sh sleep, shelter. They need to satisfy safety needs um, and then they ha need the belonging and then they need esteem and then they need self-actualization. The problem with this is um, the starving artist says, you know, means that people, some people go straight to self-actualization and don't worry too much about the physiological um, needs. So, um, but in the workplace, it means you need to pay somebody a living wage that will meet their physiological needs. The safety needs are around, you know, like a safe working environment sort of, um, you know, rules, regulations, structures, that sort of thing. And then the belonging is around being part of the group. Um, esteem is often about the recognition for, for performance, could be titles, that sort of thing. And then the last thing is actual, when they got all the bottom ones, this is what Maslow said, is when they actually self-actualise. The problem with the theory is that people often self-actualise earlier and self-actualisation is really striving to be the best, to performing at your utmost, to, you know, really um, achieving. Um, and so what Maslow said, you have to satisfy all of the lower ones first and then you could expect people to self-actualise in the workforce. Actually, that's not really valid and people will self-actualise a lot earlier. Nevertheless, people do need all of those below ones as well. Um, then there's McClellan, who talks about people having different needs. Um, so some people have a higher need for achievement than others, and some people have a higher need for esteem or power or authority than others, and some have a high need for affiliation. And in the workplace, you see that the person that chats to everyone, the person that really strives to get results, and the person that wants the position and power. Um, so I think I have a high need for achievement and then my second a high a need is the need for affiliation. And we had a bit of a question on, I think, which um, people thought their primary need was. So shall we put the poll up, Guy? Certainly. Let's see how many people. Let's Maslow analyze Trump. Oh. I think he's at the esteem. He needs um, recognition. As they say in the movie Hook, there is someone that needs a mother very much. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't be so subjective, but uh, I can't help it. I think that's probably quite interesting. So need for achievements very, very high here is about 76%. And I actually think that that's probably evident in the people that who actually are driven and self-motivated to do, uh, to learn more and to actually improve their knowledge by enrolling in a uh, online course. So uh, I think that's fairly indicative um, that we, or, you know, it's that sort of bias that we would get uh, in this particular environment. Okay, so it's oh, 78%. Ooh. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. 78% need for achievement, 7% need for authority and power, and 16% need for affiliation. So as a manager, if you know people need affiliation, then it's about, you know, providing that um, connection with others. If people need achievement, it's about working with them to set goals. Um, if they need power and esteem, then maybe it's about identifying how they can get recognition. That's a bit of a challenging one. I did have a staff member who had a very high need for recognition and it was really draining to always having to sort of, you know, put her name up, um, you know, say, recognise her publicly and things like that. It's, yeah, um, it's a challenging one. Um, okay, so then we, in terms of motivating people, there's two types of mo main motivators, intrinsic versus extrinsic. And just very, very quickly, I would say that things like promotions, pay, bonuses, benefits, prize and perks, which are extrinsic motivators, they work, but they only work for a short time. What psychology, sci psychology and uh, psychological sort of like investigations and theories and lots and lots of research has shown is that 
people who are intrinsically motivated because of the interest and enjoyment or uh, the need for achievement, the pleasure in, uh, you know, achieving and uh, reaching the goal and doing it themselves is far more motivating than all of the others. They're nice to have and they may actually win you staff in the long, in the short term, but they won't keep you staff in the long term. Again, I mean, this could be very Western centric. Um, I'm also going to talk about expectancy theory a bit and expectancy theory basically says, um, yes, okay, you might uh, set a goal for someone, an intrinsic uh, reward that they can, you know, for them to achieve something and you might reward them with something, you know, you might say, right, if you uh, meet this goal, you will get this reward. And the likelihood of them meeting the goal is how valuable is the reward to them, but also the like, uh, how hard or easy it is to meet that goal. So goals that are challenging, but not too hard. Um, you know, if people see them as achievable, not too easy, but achieve a, a little bit hard, but achievable, then they'll strive for them. But if they don't like the reward, they won't strive them. So if you say, okay, um, if you do this, you'll get a promotion. You might have one staff, yeah, go for it. The other staff back right off and perform really poorly. And it could be around the fact that that other staff member actually doesn't want the promotion. What is it that they want? So being able to understand the differences in terms of what people's wants are is quite good in terms of being able to then attach rewards to performance. Um, and if we do have small teams of eight people, then that's good because we can get to know people's preferences individually. Um, so, uh, you know, a millennial or a, a Generation X person, they might want more time off from a more flexible working environment. They want the flexibility to work from home or something like that where somebody else might be uh, interested in a pay rise. And so I've put here, um, this is again, broad stereotyping. Um, you know, a boomer might be more interested in more flexibility in hours or a few less hours rather than um, a pay rise or I mean I'm not interested in bonuses and stock I'm probably much more interested in workplace flexibility um, as a reward um, and then uh, generation x um, they might be more interested in understanding how they performed getting uh, feedback on how they can improve and build their skills for the future so it could be very very different Okay, next. And lastly, goal setting theory, and I've already alluded to this, that um, goal setting theory is really about the idea that the goals have to be achievable, they're not, but they have to be specific. People have to accept the goals. Um, they have to know that they can achieve them, so they have to be committed to them. Um, but then there's, you need to provide the support for them to be able to achieve the goals. So, you know, um, give them, the computer that they need to be able to do the work, um, uh, you know, uh, a variety of things. And then also what's the reward, um, but they also need feedback on that as well. So I'll move on very quickly. Uh, so I think I've gone way too fast, but anyway, let's, let's just take, take stock of where I'm at to. Um, so overall, it's about engaging your employees, um, about understanding what motivates them, about sort of aligning them around a purpose or a, well, the best is to try and align, align them around a purpose-driven culture um, and to be able to provide some intrinsic rewards in terms of achievement and goal setting, and then a lot of um, praise and that recognition and other things that could be useful just to add to the intrinsic benefit of achieving um, the extrinsic uh, benefits of recognition or a little bit of pay rise or other things. Um, 
So employee engagement is strongest when people enjoy their jobs, are satisfied with their work conditions, contribute meaningfully to their teams and to the overall organisational goals and feel they belong. And there's lots of elements in employee engagement and you can look at all of those in a subject about how you can improve all of these different things and all of those components. But a big component obviously within Western workplaces is around empowerment um, and um, trying to give people that ability to achieve and grow and develop. Um, and just in terms of um, the outcomes, there's been a number of studies in employee engagement around uh, purpose-driven cultures, about empowerment, about improving those um, employee uh, culture to a option environment where people are, um, committed, respected, happy, they've got good relationships with their peers, they're recognised for their work, they give them feedback on their performance, um, there's a focus on well, employee well-being, um, their jobs are well designed, they get adequate compensation for their uh, role and they're able to grow and their work is aligned with organisational outcomes. So the benefit of that is highly engaged teams show 21% greater profitability for firms. Employees who feel their voice is heard are 4.6 times more likely to feel empowered to perform their best work. And 96% of employees believe showing empathy is an important way to advance employee retention. So listening, caring, um, showing empathy and um, uh, communicating and working closely with your team um, is a way that you can show empathy and improve their employee engagement. And the, on the flip side of that, disengaged employees cost, and it was a US study, US companies up to $550 billion a year, and that's obviously nationwide. And going back to that, obviously the measure for employee engagement is, or the best measures or quickest measures for employee engagement are absentees and, and turnover. Okay. So, um, I just had a quick look at the um, chat there, see if there was anything pressing. Um, oh, I didn't talk about equity theory. Um, might mention it because it is in the quiz. Um, just in Australia, equity theory is a big um, uh, aspect of motivation. So, if people don't think that they're being treated equitably, that is very demotivating. Um, so if somebody's rewarded for behaviour and somebody isn't for the very same behavioural results, um, then uh, equity theory will say that that person will be demotiv uh, demotivated and won't perform at the best. So that's a very strong um, influence in Australia on motivation and on you know, people within your team uh, performing well. Okay. Um, So I think that pretty much that's most of what we wanted to say in this particular um, seminar. Um, again, it's a whole lot of information on speed. You can do a whole subject around this type of thing. Um, it's fascinating looking at motivation um, and learning about how to change your approach and uh, trying to introduce tiny little things and see whether they make a difference. Um, and it, it could be really beneficial for you in the organisation. But I want to say thank you all for coming along. Um, you're obviously devotees of the benefit of lifelong learning. Um, that's incredibly important in the VUCA world that we have people who have curious minds, who are open, um, who are interested in building new skills and improving those skills they already have, who are looking to uh, improve their knowledge, confidence and capabilities. So thanks for coming along. I highly recommend that you consider enrolling in an MBA with Charles Sturt University. Um, but if not, um, best of luck on your uh, journey through your career and um, it's been a pleasure. And lastly, I want to say a big thank you to Guy and to Hannah for all their um, 
support and uh, admin and planning and organising behind the scenes, it's made my experience so much easier to have them as part of the team and to do such a great job. So thanks very much, Guy and Hannah. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, B, well, that was nice. Thank you. Uh, so we've still got you for a few minutes, folks. If you want to hang around, please do, because we've got Q&A and we'll talk about the exam. And if you need to go, that's totally fine too. Um, but let's go through some questions first, Kath. Um, mm -hmm. We've got five of them so far and there's been some really interesting chat tonight. So make sure you download the chat log later on. Yeah. Everyone. Uh, but let's just go through the questions from first to last. Uh, Simon's asked, I manage people in local and offshore locations. Sometimes people in other countries expect me to be more authoritarian and consultative because of my status as a manager. Yeah. And often in the same context and on the same call. Um, how, yeah. do you, how do you straddle expectations across multiple cultures in the same place at the same time? I wonder if you could use the Hofstede tool to talk about the different approaches. Um, when I first, and I worked for four years in Indonesia, when I first worked there, I'd say to people, call me Kathy. Probably after a, a year, I'd say I, I accepted that they called me Ibu, uh, which is ma'am, pretty much. Um, my Australian egalitarian sort of um, background meant that I wanted them initially to speak to me on that one-to-one -one equal level. But over time, I realised that it was, and, and Indonesians have said to me, the hardest thing they had to do when they came to Australia was to say, use the word you, and how are you today, not how, how is sir today, how is teacher today, how is professor today, how is, um, you know, uh, ma'am today, um, because that is so informal and so rude. So it is hard, it's very hard, and particularly when people are looking for different management styles. So maybe having a conversation about that and saying, I know it's challenging, um, this is my culture. Um, this is the way I operate. I'm trying to understand and, and, and accommodate that, but I do have lots of different people. So, you know, how can we deal with that and open it up? They may have some suggestions. And if they don't say it in the meeting, ask them if they're willing to have a one-on-one -on -one, um, or whether they can chat together. I mean, again, I'm sort of hesitating because depending on the power distance, they may not feel comfortable even emailing. Um, and it's really, I mean, we've all probably met the migrant to Australia who misconstrues that kind of egalitarianism and sort of takes it to the wrong level. And culture is such a minefield in that, in that uh, space because unless you actually grow up in that culture, it's so hard to really understand all the elements of it. So I don't know the perfect answer, but you can look at maybe addressing it and that might help. As is so often the case, the answer is maybe. Mm, um, exactly. Kim, who was so uh, active in the chat tonight, and thank you, Kim, and John as well. I'll ask your question next. Does culture live in the organisation or in the people in the organisation? Is this another maybe? No, no, so it's both. Um, so obviously Australian culture has a big impact on Australian business culture. And so Indian culture will have a big impact on Indian business culture. So they are quite intertwined. Um, they, they, it's both. But obviously there are differences in culture between one organisation in Australia and another. Um, so, uh, yeah, culture is so rich and so different from organisation to organisation. It's much nicer than it's too hard, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is sometimes what I think. Uh, Simon uh, has asked again, as more millennials and younger people enter the workforce, will turnover increase given that they favour job mobility? And I guess I could extend that question by saying, you know, is this still a, a sort of a, a life phase? Um, so I, or, or is it about people's different experiences born in a different time? Yeah, it's a bit of both. Um, so I think it's chicken and egg there because I think there are millennials that would love a stable job. And as they get older and, you know, they look at mortgages and things like that, it's really frightening not to have a stable job. Um, I know someone who just bought a new house and moved and then, um, didn't get the contract extension that they wanted to. So it's 
really frightening. Um, with the gig economy, uh, with the constant change uh, in workplaces, that having uh, long-term positions is probably quite hard for millennials. So then they get used to moving. So then they move. I don't, um, so it is a bit of a chicken and an egg. Some people do want to move and be more mobile and other people would like um, something more long-term but can't get it. Thank you. Uh, Ian asks, how do you determine what people want? Uh, is it is it about testing and measurement or intuition? You know, no. how about asking? Well, that's or, a nice. Way. <laughs> or, um, or maybe having a little tea room discussion about mm. oh, if you could choose, um, you know, uh, five rewards, what would you value most? How, and seeing what everybody's differences are, but mm. I think you know people after a while too, don't you? Well, if the turnover isn't too bad. Yeah, if the turnover isn't too bad. <laughs> um, and the last question we've got so far, and maybe the last one I'll accept before we start talking about other things. Uh, John, who was also active in the chat, and thank you, John. I'm interested to see how the how world leaders handle coronavirus. If anything is VUCA, it's pandemic. Have you got any sorts of, so any yeah. sort of insights or thoughts or about, about uh, the coronavirus gap? Yes, yeah, so I was thinking about that today and thinking, gee, if I was writing this, you know, these set of slides or this, uh, these topics now, um, I would be featuring coronavirus. Virus. I was writing them when the bushfire's on, but hey, isn't that amazing? That is so, um, so VUCA, it is. Its impact is enormous. Um, I mean, We've got whole ports shut down. We've got whole cities shut down. We've got this um, 100,000 um, Chinese students wanting to come to Australia and unable to get here. We've got uh, supply chains disrupted. Um, we've got such an amazing, interesting, scary, fascinating situation. But I think it is characteristic of the VUCA world and the need for adaptability because let's uh, go back over the past few couple of decades, we've had 9-11, which had a big impact on um, transglobal movement um, and a big impact on trade and political relations. Um, uh, and then well, we've had SARS, we've had um, the global financial crisis, we've had the Boxing Day tsunami, we've had the um, Fukushima nuclear disaster and the um, Japanese tsunami. So there's, and all of those had had global ripples and impacted on organisations. Um, not every organisation, but organisations have been impacted. So I think coronavirus is just another example of the VUCA world and, and the um, amazing impact that anything uh, any of these disasters, whether they're pandemics or uh, financial or ecological, um, have on our business uh, operations today. Awesome, thank you. And and you know even you know the ambiguity around the, the statistics and and what's actually happening. It's it's all. When will it finish? Yeah, How long will it go for? Mm. <laughs> yeah, it looks like people are recovering, but are they? Are there any long time? Will it come back? <laughs> will then become zombies? <laughs> I've got my plan. I hope you all do too. Uh, that's all the questions. So, oh, actually, there's one more. We'll have a look at it. Uh, oh, okay. More of a comment, and that's fine. We'll finish with the comment on on the actual content tonight, and then we'll go into the exam chat. Othman. Uh, says culture has a big, big influence on international projects. Project management has to have a large understanding of culture to win or to succeed or to have good outcomes, depending on you know, the outcomes and depending on the culture. I suppose that's all true. That's it's true. so true. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. So, so let's talk exam. Uh, Kat's been good enough to write an exam that is based on all the materials available you know, with this short course. Um, so no study is at, no study outside of the course materials that you'll find on the course page is necessary. It's all in the readings, all in the webinars. 
Um, but if you do want to excel, is that true? So I would say readings and webinars. I mean, yeah. I probably would say 75% of is just on the readings, but there are some questions that, because writing 40 questions is really challenging. So I had <laughs> to use some of the material from the webinars, but it's not a significant amount. No. Um, most of it should be what's in the readings. Okay. Uh, the exam comprises 40 multiple choice questions. Uh, you'll have an hour to complete the exam once you start. So, so please don't attempt it until you think you're ready. Uh, the timer continues even if you close the page or if you have technical issues. Um, so, so yeah, just make sure you're prepared. If you do have a major issue, you know, technical issue when you sit the exam or when, you know, if something gets in the way, to do please get in touch. We can organise a resit um, and we can sort of see what's been going on with your attempt. Uh, you'll need to do the quizzes that attach to each module before you can sit the exam, they're hurdle requirements. Um, so you can attempt those quizzes as many times as you like, they're just hurdle requirements, um, uh, just to make sure that you're engaged in, in the modules topic, uh, and then you can move on to the exam. And the exam is available now. Um, so there's no cutoff date, so to speak, or, or due date, but I, I really strongly recommend that you make a plan to finish it soon because all of the evidence that we have suggests that um, the, the longer you leave it, the less likely you are to actually take it. Um, much more than a week and you'll likely fall by the wayside and just never get the, the exam done, which is fine because this, hopefully the cast really interesting webinars and the chat and the discussion has been, has been its own reward. But if you want something tangible at the end of it, you've got course certificates. No obligation to complete the course's assessment, but, but passing the exam means you're awarded a course certificate for your CV, which is always nice. And, and completion of three of these short courses allows you to claim an elective credit in any IT Masters and CSU joint course, including the MBA computing. Um, so, so you could claim an elective subject after doing three of these subjects and you, know, you can sort of understand why when you, when you think about the quality of CATH short course. I'm sure I've forgotten something. So are there any questions about that? You can chuck it in the chat. That's fine. We'll, we'll have a quick chat about that. Um, also, uh, once you've finished your exam, once you've finished with the, the course materials, um, could you please finish the course survey? That's at the bottom of the, the course page underneath the assessment module. Um, basically, it just asks a few questions about the course and how it relates to your your work and how applicable it is to your work and whether you're interested in further study. It really helps us sort of make sure that we deliver good short courses for you, courses that are relevant and, and useful and, you know, it, it always helps us improve. So that's really important, I think. Um, there's also links there that will let you go and, and do an eligibility assessment. Um, so I can get in touch with you if you, if you feel in that form and, and sort of say, well, this is where you stand with existing credit and, uh, eligibility to access the course, whether it's the MBA computing or the MBA general. Um, you know, we're always happy to pass people on to Kath, who's you know, clearly got all of the expertise you'll possibly need. Um, and if you are super keen on going on with the, the after this short course, get in touch, um, put your details in the, the course survey and, and we'll, we'll follow up from that. Uh, finally, I guess, um, Hannah, thank you for keeping folk engaged in the chat. Um, for hanging around after business hours. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoy the time in Lou. Uh, Kath, thank you for everything. Um, it's been so nice working with you on this course. I really enjoyed, you know, the, the webinars themselves and the family experience with Baby Yoda, so who, who probably deserves a credit in IMDb. I'm not sure how this thing works, but... <laughs> she can really come and say goodbye. Oh yeah, beauty, come, come, and, say, come and say goodbye. Um, I've also really enjoyed the, the ambiguity of this course, you know, so the A and the VUCA, it's, uh, you know, so many maybe propositions. Hello, baby Yoda, uh, everyone <laughs> say good day. Um, it, it's just been really interesting and, and, and so much more nuanced than you might have expected, I might have, I expected at the start of the course. So, so thank you. And thank you everyone for, for listening along. I'll, as usual, leave it up to you, Kath, to say goodbye and, and perhaps baby Yoda, but um, yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone. And yeah, dealing with humans is really like uh, nuanced and difficult and may there's lots of maybes. <laughs> yeah.
All right. Well, it's been wonderful. Thank you very much. See you all in cyberspace, maybe sometime. Um, good luck with the exam. And um, thanks very much again, Guy and Hannah. Bye all.